of e-commerce can be tricky, and that's why you need the experts to help take you to the next level. This is Delivering E-Commerce, and this is Chris Parsons. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is Delivering E-Commerce with Chris Parsons, and I'm so excited today to have Steve Croft with us. Steve and I have been trying to get together and do this podcast for probably six to seven months now. And finally, we were able to connect our calendars and be able to bring this to you. Steve, welcome. Thank you. That's all my fault, by the way. I'm, <laughs> I'm the busy guy. <laughs> like, literally, you and I started talking about the podcast before I actually started doing the podcast four or five months ago. So it's it's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm looking forward to everyone hearing your story, as well as learning more about zip.co. So Steve, let's start off. Tell, tell us about your journey. Oh, I have a probably unorthodox journey. You know, I'm I'm I've worked for big companies. I'm a two-time entrepreneur. I love tech. I love retail. I've you know founded two businesses. One one was Flip Give, which is still operating. Um, I love technology, so I've got into over my career some crazy stuff: robotic process automation. I've run SaaS companies. I've been in marketing roles, sales roles. I think I just love doing different things and I love challenges and that's kind of how I'm built. And I really like the activity of building businesses and that's what attracted me to Zip. Mm -hmm. um, and the story like getting here is interesting because back in 2018, I got approached by um, a bank to help them disrupt uh, the lending space. And they were going, they were looking at, uh, payday loans, and they wanted to get into fair lending. And that really got me into fintech. It, I spent about a month assessing that opportunity and looking at the lending sector. And what was interesting was I had a lot of preconceived notions and biases about what type of individuals use those services and why they use them. And those things ended up not being true. And that project, interestingly enough, you know, was one where I was going to get fully funded, lots of capital. So it was like an entrepreneur's dream. It didn't end up happening, but it led me into working with other fintechs that were kind of uncovering a lot of the issues we have with banking and how people get paid in Canada. Uh, I have a buddy that just started one called Paytm, which is really interesting. It's for, you know, gig economy workers, and it's about factoring their timesheets and and they're paying, giving it to them in more real time. Um, and I met these guys through a mutual friend that runs a Canadian technology company. And, and Zip at the time was, you know, they just had made the acquisition uh, of QuadPay recently uh, out of the US and they just had a mandate to expand globally. So they were looking at coming into Canada to be one of the leading, you know, consumer finance or buy now, pay later companies. And I, I was at a point in my career where, again, I had an opportunity to start do a startup, but with resources and capital, which are the things that you're kind of always looking for uh, to you know, enable you to be successful. And in a space that was just emerging super hot and kind of played in an area that I really love, which is e-commerce and, and retail. Um, and so I kind of jumped at it. You know, the people were great. Uh, which is important at this point in my career. You know, I don't work with yeah. amazing people and nice people and, you know, have challenges where, you know, I'm in control of, of my fate and, you know, I can be successful. So, um, yeah, we're, Zip, is, Zip is a really interesting firm. We're um, probably the, the global leader in, in buy now, pay later and, and financing. It's been a really fun ride. Uh, we stood up Canada in April. Um, you know, we're still, I'm still building my team and building the practice here, but, uh, it's been enjoyable for me, not only to, to build again, but to learn the ins and outs of this space and kind of get reacquainted with a lot of the people that I worked with back at Flipgive, you know, on the e-commerce side, uh, at resale. So let's, uh, before we get too much into to zip.co and buy now, pay later, let's talk a little bit about Flip. Yeah. You want to talk about Flipgive a bit? Yeah. Why, why not? I mean, that was, that's, I think where we first came across each other many years ago, 
Yeah. Uh, so let's let's go back a little bit in history there and talk about that. Because you said, you know, your journey is is a little bit all over the place. And it was funny. I had a conversation today with somebody on the phone and they were looking at my LinkedIn profile and they're like, your LinkedIn profile is confusing to me. And I said, what? why do you say that? And they were like, oh, well, you have hockey socks on there. You have tidy, tidy living on there. I'm like, oh, yeah, because while I do run e-commerce sites for company, I am an entrepreneur as well. Right. So as you look at my profile, you're like, what is this guy doing? And I can see how it's it's confusing. But <clears throat> those are those are proud moments in my career to be able to launch yeah. my own my own couple of businesses and, and be a part of these startups that I, I don't want to take them off of my profile. So after explaining it, they understood it. But I guess anyone seeing my profile for the first time, they're like, is he in e-commerce or does he run his own business? I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Flipkit was a really interesting journey. It was kind of born out of business school, believe it or not. I was at the time I was working at Microsoft and I decided to do my executive MBA and go back to Ivy. And while I was there, I met a couple people that we came up with this idea uh, around fundraising because we were parents with kids and we were doing these like fun fairs and selling overpriced chocolate bars. You probably know this stuff because yeah. you're in the hockey. Uh, almonds, just stuff that people didn't want or need. And at the same time, you're spending all this money, you know, buying hockey equipment or, you know, booking travel, hotels, you know, coaching sessions. And we were like, how do we leverage the spending power of these communities of individuals, either when you're fundraising at school or for a sports team for good? And then we said, you know, well, what do retailers want? They want customers and sales. And what do we want? We want money back. So we just looked at the affiliate model. We kind of said, oh, it's in, this is interesting. What if we could take this model and, and flip it on its head and, you know, go to, go to brands and say, we'll bring you customers. And what you do is you, you know, create these special offers for customers that when they shop with you, they get dollars back to their school or their sports team and you get credit for supporting them locally. And I think the model was just really interesting. You know, we, we raised money in about 2012, our first round to really commercialize the concept. And we were a small team. I think at the time we were probably about 10 people selling like multi-billion dollar brands like Under Armour and, and <laughs> others like that, the Indigos of the world, you know, which, which is, that's, that's what I'm proud of. I think that's just incredible to do that and, and trying to work with, you know, major channel partners, sports associations and others. And like, I think today the business has been so successful. My partners are now running it, uh, Nick and Mark, and it's, I think they're doing about 150 million in, in GMV and they have hundred, hundreds and thousands of users. And now they're getting into, you know, the, the financing portion of, of sports for sports teams, but it's just a really interesting kind of group buying and demand you know model that i think is fairly unique in the world well uh, I, I loved it to be honest i mean i don't know how many times i had to go door to door with my kid or collect bottles that are stinky beer bottles to go and <laughs> cash in 10 cents of the time <clears throat> to be able to put this model in place was was brilliant from a from a parent to hockey dad it, it would saved you just went and spent money doing your regular shopping and got rewarded for your kids fundraiser the model is yeah. spot on. So uh, anyone that have, hasn't tried it, I would suggest signing up. It's hockey season now. Every team's looking for fundraising. Yeah. It's a, it's a great model. And um, Canadians, as Canadians, we spend a lot of money on hockey. But what's interesting is, you know, uh, the most expensive support, surprisingly to us, was gymnastics. It was mm -hmm. just off the charts what people pay to try and get their you know, their child an opportunity to make the Olympic teams, especially in the U.S. It, it's It's crazy. I had a dad moment with my son the other day. I was buying him a new hockey stick and he picked out a, a true hockey stick and it was $250. And then I went into the story about back in my day, I used to get a hockey stick for $45. And he was, he was like, okay, sure, dad, whatever. Yeah, $10 that Canadian tire. The right, for the one Titan, with no, with no uh, curve on the blade. You had to put it over your stove and do it yourself. Yeah. So, and we walked uphill back and forth for school both ways and <laughs> all those fun things. Okay. So zip.co, the buy now, pay later phenomenal. That is just, everybody is looking at this. Tell it, tell us more about zip.co and buy now, pay later and how you guys fill that gap. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, you know, from a, a consumer perspective, you know, it's a really 
buy now, pay later is just an easy to use service that lets people buy something and finance it over time, usually like at zero cost to them or 0% interest. So with us, you know, our, our online um, and in-store offering allows people to basically buy something, finance it at zero cost to them over a six weeks period, six week period. So they pay 25% when they buy and then every two weeks they pay another 25%. So for, for you know, consumers, it's a great alternative to credit card and it really resonates with younger audiences when you're looking at you know, people that are millennials or pre-millennials that don't want credit cards, don't want to pay the fees, don't want to pay the interest rates. Those are the types of individuals that are using this stuff. Um, and then on the retailer side, you know, there's probably, well, I was just at a conference where it was the topic that everyone was, you know, conversing about. Yeah. Um, I think globally, um, you know, worldwide, based on the 2019 data, we were at about 2.1% of e-commerce worldwide, which is big. It's a $97 billion number, but they're expecting this thing to grow to somewhere in the four to 6% range. So it could be anywhere from, 200 to you know 350 billion dollars worth of e-commerce revenue only and it's now you know permeating into store but retailers are using this basically as a way to help uh, drive more conversions through their funnel so resonate with customers that typically wouldn't be able to transact because they don't have credit cards or a payment method or for those that are kind of casual you know shoppers and they're saying ah oh, i don't have the budget right now to afford this because it doesn't fit in, you know, to my, my, my um, time period for budgeting, but the way we've constructed the plans are there's six weeks, which is by design that we're going across multiple, you know, pay periods so that people can afford to make these payments. So retailers love it because it drives conversions. And, and what we see with our product, and I think it's generally true for the industry is that people spend more money. Um, right. You know, they're spending, we're, we're seeing order values of 60 to 80%, you know, increase uh, over what they uh, normally would have. And then a lot of frequency, people coming back and, you know, making other purchases. So it's a good value prop for retailers. I, I think a lot of them are, are really looking at it as we need to be relevant and stay relevant. And especially with what's going on with e-commerce, e-commerce is really a global game now. You've got a lot of players moving into Canada and other markets from overseas. So you want to be able to compete with those firms. And a lot of those firms are offering like alternative payment methods. So um, if you want to, if you want to be, you know, um, relevant with the younger people, then you need to have solutions like this. And it's funny when I look at other markets that are a little bit more advanced than we are, like Australia, New Zealand that have had this for longer, it's actually starting to age up. So, you know, it's the younger, um, more digital savvy people are the adopters, and then it ends up becoming more mainstream. The, the whole crossing the chasm, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it makes total sense that buy now, pay later is taking off. When you think about how Gen Z and the younger millennials shop versus the way you and I would shop, we would buy things and we would own it right away. And, you know, <clears throat> now, when it comes to TV, for example, you consume it on Netflix. It's a subscription fee. When you consume YouTube, it's a subscription fee. All of these fees now start to add up. So all of a sudden, they're looking at their disposable income saying, you know what? I want a subscription fee type of plan, and that's buy now, pay later. Yes, it's not over a course of a, a monthly subscription. It's six weeks. But they're still taking that mindset and breaking up the cost of an item into incremental payments, just like they do for any other subscription that they do. Yeah, I, I love that comparison because I, I kind of think of it that way too. It's, you know, buy now, pay later is enabling the subscription economy for traditional merchants. That's really what this is doing. And if you look at what our, where everyone is going to like the pay and end models where, you know, it's three, six, nine, 12, 24 months, it's just going to keep reinforcing that. And it as a consumer, I, I like that. You know, I don't want to have to make big lump sum payments. And like you're saying, those services that I have otherwise, like Netflix app, you know, um, Apple one, I think it's called now. Yeah. Um, those, those things I'm used to paying on a monthly basis. And it just makes the, the cash flow situation a lot better for individuals. 
Yeah. And, and you mentioned because that's that's really the the thing that I learned with um, you know looking at payday lending. It wasn't that people couldn't afford things. It was always a cash flow issue. Yeah. And you know, companies have traditionally paid workers monthly or every two weeks, but that's not the way that we consume. You know, we consume daily. So something has to change. I actually think most of the challenge comes from the way that people are paid and that needs to be disrupted as well. You know, people should be paid real time for the work that they do, but um, this is like that gap, you know, that stop gap, because it's gonna be pretty hard to convince companies to give up their money on an hourly or daily basis, they're probably just not going to do it. Yeah. I, I mean, who knows what the future holds, maybe progressive companies will see that as an incentive for getting some talent on board that they, they pay that model. And as the gig economy grows, that's how, you know, Fiverr, for example, or can, can support and pay their millions of people that are now offering different services. So I think, I think it's not that far off for people to start looking at that, especially as a retailer trying to recruit and st stand out from everybody else that they, if they can say that they have a different model and they can pay more frequent um, so you can manage your budget. I mean, even governments, when they pay out their, their welfare checks, they're doing it on a, on a monthly basis, right? When you already have someone in need of money, paying out on a monthly basis doesn't make any sense. They're already struggling with probably the, the basic finance skills that they require. And you're trying to have them wait a full month before they get their next pay. Whereas if it was an incremental payment, maybe they would be able to manage it a little bit better for their family. Yeah. And the other interesting thing just about that and how people get credit and, and paid is the credit model is also, I'd say, fairly antiquated in the way in which we determine the credit worthiness of someone. You know, if you look at the FICO scoring method, it, it's punitive the way that we score people. You could make 10,000 payments on something, which you get no credit for. If you make four non-payments or, you know, you default on four things, even though it's like less than 1% of your, you know, your history, you get penalized for that. I think that, that there's a good opportunity for that to change in the future. So, when you look at the decisioning engines of these companies, which is really what's changed the game, you know, we're not looking just at that traditional credit score. We're looking at a whole bunch of other factors that, you know, we gather data from different types of methods, you know, using online tools, um, identity device type of information mm -hmm. to determine credit worthiness. So I think that's what gets me really excited is like, hey, this is a real different way of doing things. Um, and then I also like the fact that it's disrupting, you know, the traditional banking sector and, and credit card models, which, you know, as a consumer and a Canadian, you know, we have a pretty unique situation here where we have a bit of an oligopoly with the banks. And, you know, we, we, we didn't see real reductions in our credit card interest rates when interest rates were at an all time low, you know, over the last couple of years. So you got to kind of scratch your head and say, like, at some point. You know, we just need more choice and more options. And so I, I welcome like all the products like this into the market because I just think it's going to make things better for us as Canadians. Yeah, I totally agree. And you talked about the benefits to retailers and that being conversion. But I would also think that you would get customer acquisition from this because you're allowing people that traditionally don't have the opportunity to to buy online because they don't have the credit. They're now able to to do that. And um, the one question I had as I was thinking about this model and when <clears throat> when you display zip.co to uh, co consumers on any website, it doesn't matter what retailer you pick a retailer, um, are you now able to work with the retailer to show people, here's what it here's the cost, I don't know, of a Dyson vacuum, $4.99, but your payment over four weeks is this. They see that up front. So that way it helps encourage that that transaction versus them saying, oh my God, this is a $500 purchase. Yeah, it sits like right on the product display pages. We have a widget that goes underneath. So it does make the item more affordable. And that's what I think drives the order values. People say, well, that's something that, you know, fits into my budget. So I'm, you know, more apt to purchase those items. Um, that's really where the magic is. You know, we are in checkout as well. So we're a payment option you would pick just like PayPal or, or Visa. Um, but it, it like more to the point in what you were talking about earlier, um, 
what's interesting about it is like they're 80 percent of or 80 plus percent of our users link their debit card to their accounts they don't have credit cards and you think about it in canada specifically there's really no easy way to pay online with a debit card right so it's these people just don't have you know the ability to transact and you know from that perspective you get access to the audiences i think you know you get access to our audiences through our app which you know we'll be introducing shortly in canada but you know, we have, I think, 600,000 downloads a month in the U.S. on our app, and we're over 5 million users. That's also really interesting, too, about what I've seen um, with some of the data that's been coming in for Canada is we have an enormous amount of people that are shopping cross-border, and they're shopping in, like, categories that you wouldn't think are really popular, but apparently they're the top ones at, at Shopify as well. But, you know, fashion, beauty, um, sports and outdoor, those are the, and, and home. Uh, those are the ones that, you know, people are really um, are shopping aggressively with, I would say. And, you know, within beauty, it's things like uh, eyelashes, eyelash extensions and hair extensions. Like, I just never knew this stuff. Like, uh being outside of like a big e-commerce company and, and seeing it, it's just like, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's, it is fascinating when you get into those stats and just, if anyone's thinking, my eyelashes are real. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but, but, sorry, bud, I didn't mean to do that to you. Um, so when it comes to though a retailer and how they position it, that cup of coffee a day, to consumers, the breakdown of, of the math, make it simple for them. So you got conversion, you got customer acquisition from it, from, from a retailer's benefit. And I think the other piece is once you know a customer is willing to spend a certain frequency with you, whether that's $100 every couple of weeks, $300, whatever that is, you can really get into some creative marketing um, strategies with those customers to say, okay, they've just completed paying off X product. Here's our equivalent complementary product to message them and get them right back onto that that buying plan again with a new product. Is, is Do you see other, other retailers doing that already? I think it's emerging. You know, that's a, that's a, the personalization of, you know, shopping and I think being predictive on what people are looking for. I think that's the holy grail. That's kind of where we all want to go, um, including me. Like I want it for myself. I find that, you know, with some sites, I think they just have to catch up because their right. their search engines aren't that great. It's really hard to find stuff, but you should know enough about me. I think that the machine learning should be able to inform, like, this is the type of persona right. of this individual and this is the buying pattern they have. So we're getting better with that stuff on our app and we're learning. I think the interesting thing for us is that you know, with most retailers, they have a very narrow view of a consumer. They're just looking at, you know, within their own ecosystem, their own e-commerce site or their own stores. And what we have is with our app, we have people that are shopping cross category with multiple retailers. So we can start to make connections, almost like the, you know, dad beer diapers, mm -hmm. you know, data mining example from way back when, but we're saying, oh yeah, if people shop at this brand and buy this, then they typically shop at this brand and buy this. And what I get excited about a little bit is there's probably some, you know, partnering opportunities with our e-commerce providers and, and our retail partners to work together because, you know, they have like customer sets and those customer sets like shopping with both of them. So that's the stuff that I think is really interesting, but where I would love to get is like, we know where we know what you want to buy before you're you're ready to buy it or before you've even thought about it. And yeah, and I think there's great synergy. Like <clears throat> if at some point you can get complementary with other retailers. So, you know, if, if we have it on our website and then a non-competitor has it like Sephora on their website, and you can start to state look at the data together and say, okay, what are people buying from multiple retailers and how can we start collaborating and putting different packages together? Mm -hmm. One of one of the stories I, I tell frequently to my team is about this tuna and toothpaste analogy from, from Walmart. And I started doing, my first role was in data analytics and I started trying to dig into why uh, we couldn't get a big spike on, on toothpaste. And the reality is you only consume toothpaste at a consistent rate. 
right? You're not going to, just yeah. because it goes on sale, you're not going to buy more toothpaste or you will buy more, but you're not going to consume more. So ultimately you still end up with the amount of same toothpaste used at the end of the year. But if you sell stuff that's going to impact someone's breath, like tuna, and they now are going to brush their teeth more frequently, you can sell more toothpaste through the year. So by putting those data mines together, you can really start to have a retailer augment how they go to market with different products and get more consumable, more frequency out of it. And I think that's what excites me about a buy now, pay later plan is understanding maybe someone has a consumable item and puts it on a buy now, pay, pay later plan. And every six weeks, they're starting to buy the same, same product and use it as a subscription tool for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and those are the things that we're starting to look at that and also the connections like cross, like you're saying, the predictive things. If someone buys this, then are they more apt to buy that? And then can we proactively market to them? But yeah, it, it's it's there's just a whole bunch of different data points that are really interesting. And I'm glad we have the science guys working on that stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm just the one that asks the questions and they're the ones that provide the modeling and information to us. Um, but this is just gonna, I, I think, you know, there's gonna be a lot of movement in that area and in, in shopper personalization and insights and machine learning and AI around this stuff over the next couple of years. It's gonna be a great space to be in. Yeah, I agree. I've, over the last couple of days in and out of meetings, I've had up on my screen the Commerce Next uh, conference going on and they've been live streaming it from, from New York. And I, I know a couple of people, um, speakers have been mentioning the buy now, pay later. So it is definitely a hot topic in our industry. And I'm really excited that you're able to you know share time with me tonight to get exposure and our audience learn a little bit about this. So what are some of the other benefits that you see? Because I want to make sure any retailer watching this um, over the next qu couple of weeks is getting the information. What are what, are, what am I missing that I haven't told our audience already of some of the pros from a retailer perspective um, that they can see from a buy now, late, pay later plan? Like I think the ones that we talked about earlier, you know, when you look at the value proposition, it's around increasing conversion rate. I'm a, I'm a, you know, e-com guy myself. So I was funnel obsessed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it was about how much, how do I squeeze more out of the lemon, you know, fix my leaky bucket, yep. get as many people as possible through. And, you know, if you think about a lot of firms, they spend tons of money, like getting people top of funnel, but you got those people in there. You want to make sure you're, you're converting. And I, I think if you look at the industry figures right now, they're pretty um, dismal in terms of conversion rates for people that are like in cart. So you can do a 20% increase that's massive for most retailers. So that's the first thing. And the second is the increase in order values. So 60 to 80% you're looking at um, on So let's average. touch on that, on the, uh, the average order value going up. Is that because people are trading up. So if they were looking at a 499 barbecue and they look at the breakdown of the payments over the six weeks, they're now like, oh, you know what, I'm going to get that one with the side burner. I'm going to get the stainless steel grill instead of the one I was going to buy because over the course of six weeks, it's maybe a difference of 75, hundred bucks. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's one aspect of it, the trading up. The other aspect is that, you know, they're buying a secondary product. So, hey, I bought a jacket. I want to get a pair of pants that I wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise, but now it fits within my budget. Mm -hmm. um, and the last, like, really interesting point is we have, uh, it's a unique, we have a unique commercial model in Canada where we can charge for value both on the merchant side and on the consumer side. We have something called MFPP which is merchant fee for payment plan. So um, we can charge the customer anywhere from, you know, a dollar to $3 per installment, depending on the amount that they spend. And we find when we put something like that in place, people tend to spend more money. And the reason why they're spending more money is kind of akin to like, if you take money out at an ATM, you know, and you're spending like a buck 50 to get, you know, hundred dollars yeah. thing. But if you're charged three fifty or four bucks, you're probably going to take out three hundred. Right. So there's that effect as well. So those are the reasons for like the the AOVs. And then you know, lastly, I think it's you know really looking at that repeat customer rate. So customers will come back because they can afford to come back and um, and buy more stuff that fits into their budget. So. Those are the primary value propositions. And then a lot of retailers are obviously looking at these services with their apps and audiences for reach. You know, they want to they want to get access to these, you know, end users and consumers. So 
that provides an alternative channel to like the traditional, you know, players in market like Facebook, you know, Instagram and, and others that people use, you know, Google for acquiring customers. That's great. And Steve, how do, how do anyone listening to this? How does anyone listening to this um, get in contact with you? Oh, they can go to zip.co and, and look us up. You know, we have IP detection, so they'll know that they're Canadian. All the information is there. If they're a retailer, they can go to the for business uh, section. If, um, if they're a consumer, there's lots of information there that they can look at and understand which retailers we're with. And, you know, you'll see that you'll see us at checkout and on those product display pages. That's great. And on the uh, coming out of the COVID environment, are you going to be at, attending any conferences like e-tail in Canada or anything like that coming up? Uh, absolutely. I just went to one uh, last week. I went to MAG, which is the Merchant Advisory Group down in Orlando, Florida. So I went into the mouth of the, the lion, you know, right into COVID central. And I think there was about 400 attendees and a lot of major retailers and a lot of payments companies. It was really refreshing and good to get back to in person again. It's something I didn't realize how much I missed it, but you know, just the networking, the talking with people, the learning, that environment that I can't wait. So, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for our events in Canada to open up sooner rather than later. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I just saw a posting for, and you probably don't know who this artist is, but Luke Combs, he's a country music artist. I, my son loves him and I wanted to surprise him with tickets, but um, $300 a ticket for a concert. I don't know what happened from before COVID to after COVID, but they went from $100 to $300. So I'll buy him a record and that's what he'll have to get. He's not, he's not gonna I don't think you can buy records anymore, but you probably can. <laughs> Actually, you can probably buy vinyl. You can't buy vinyl yeah. anymore. <laughs> hey, so as you are obviously in the industry, speaking to a lot of retailers, um, do you see any other trends now that uh, e-commerce has, you know, at first it was like fast forwarded so many years, five years in, in advance now, um, coming out of COVID, it's kind of a little bit reverting back. You see people, you know, exploring the malls again, but uh, is there any trends that you can uh, identify for our audience? Well, the one I would say that is the biggest that we're seeing is just the cross-border stuff. I think retailers are trying to be global by nature. And you saw the Shopify yeah. announcement the other day. So entering into other markets, you know, that's a big one. A lot of retailers are using currency plugins to, you know, mimic that they're global in, in operations. But I think that's, you know, really interesting. Obviously, in-house brands that seems to continue to grow you know, unique partnerships between retailers and, and providers. That's something that's always on the radar. And then I just think, you know, looking at um, new ways in which to make it easier for customers to transact with them. So whether that's in store with, you know, new payment methods or online, I think there's a lot of talk about express methods, you know, one click methods for checkout that they seem to be picking up steam. Um, you know, and then alternative payment methods like, you know, crypto, uh, right. a lot of them are talking about that, like, hey, should we start taking Bitcoin? Should we take Ether? Um, what role can we play in, in those things? So we're seeing seeing a lot of that. Um, and then I kind of feel like there is probably going to be a little bit of a renaissance on the in-store mm -hmm. components, like um, because I think it's something that consumers have generally missed. And I know for myself, I just went into uh, a Best Buy store near me like a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I loved it. Like the store, first of all, the store looked amazing. Um, I don't know if it's because I haven't been in one for a while, but I think they've done a really good job with their stores. And then secondly, just having that tactile experience after you know being online for so long, there's something to be said for that. So I think, I think the move to try and meld the experiences between online and offline. I think there's going to be a big movement towards that. And then I think people are going to want to get out and, and back into the malls and the stores eventually. It's just, we all want, we all want to be out and doing stuff. And I think we're just, we're tired of being, you know, kind of locked up. So yeah. I see that, that as being a, a pretty big trend. I, I agree. And, you know, I, I talk about a book, a remarkable retail all the time. And, 
Um, it talks about the harmonized shopper and the harmonized shopping experience. And, and really, that's what I think it is. It's not one channel versus another. It's customers are going to shop all those channels depending on what they have going on. And, and as, a, as a retailer, we have to make that seamless for them. We have to let them know that they're shopping that brand and having that same brand experience across all of those channels. So it's not confusing to them which experience they're they're participating in. And, and I think retail has a, a long way to go with that. But now I think the finally the technology is catching up to that dream of an omni-channel experience. Yeah, absolutely. And then from a consumer perspective, you know, just for me personally, I think there's I've just learned a lot in you know, transacting over the last, you know, year and a half, especially online and the things that kind of are driving me. And I think there's some retailers that have picked up on this as well Is like more choice isn't always better, right? right. Um, people are getting really savvy about products. So we're tired of fake reviews. We're tired of crappy products. Like we are looking for quality and stuff. So you want to be able to do transactions with brands that you trust and with products that are endorsed by people that you know, you know, we're just, there's too much fake stuff out on the internet. The internet can be a place that just, as you know, like is, is um, just fraught with BS. So oh. you make sure that when you're buying products and services that you're, you know, it's there, there's people that know about those things and have used them and can endorse them. So I, I also see that as a, as a big trend probably moving forward is like social selling, I think will become you know, a thing, the live shopping obviously is something that everyone's talking about, but social selling for me is, you know, I think it's a frontier that needs to be explored. What are my friends buying? You know, what brands do they love and trust? What products have they used that they would recommend? Yeah. Those are the conversations that you have word of mouth, but technology can start to enable some of those things. And I think that will be pretty exciting when it, when it really takes root. Yeah, I mean, taking root, 30% of all e-commerce sales are coming from that channel already. So um, it's it's there. It's just it needs to be a little bit more integrated, a little bit more seamless. So we don't want to be in a face when someone's really trying to enjoy a social experience. As a brand, you don't want to be, look at this product, but let, <laughs> let, the, let the audience engage as much as they want with, with the products is, is going to be key. I think, you know... You talked about, and I don't know if I posted on LinkedIn the other day that I was on a, a podcast. Pierre was the was hosting me as his guest, which was the reverse situation. And um, I think I went off on ratings and reviews for five minutes. It was a big pet peeve of mine in the industry on how I, I can shop one website and the product's rated a one. And I can shop another website and that same product with 100 reviews is rated a five. And you're like, what is this product crap or is it good? I have no idea. And yeah. Then, then I have to call a friend because I'm like, yeah. hey, you bought this. How is it? Yeah. And I just had the experience with a mattress. I wanted to buy a mattress and it's the worst because there's so many providers. There's new providers on Amazon. I think one was called Zinus. Um, and it was a mixed bag of reviews. There was too much choice. I finally just picked one because right. I'm like, I just need to make a decision. But it actually, you know, for someone like me, uh, I was surprised at how the choice and, you know, the amount of, um, I would say, paid media there is, like online with, you know, blogs that are talking about this mattress over this one. It just creates confusion for the customer. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up just asking a couple friends, like, hey, have you guys bought one of these things and do you like it? And they were like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's the one I'm going to go with. Then. Yeah, the conversation I have with my team is, um, cause we get pressure to do the endless aisle concept where you're just adding option after option. And, and what I want to do is the extended aisle, not the endless aisle, because I think we should do some of that shopping for a customer. So, you know, a bad example for home hardware, but let's say we were in the TV market and uh, we should have a good, better, best, maybe a premium, let customers know and have the confidence that we've done the research and we've, we've curated this assortment that is the best for them and let them pick from those versus saying, here's 30, 30 inch televisions. Good luck figuring it out. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that's a good approach. And I, I personally would, would, uh, that would be more welcoming for me as a shopper. Yeah, agreed. Hey, Steve, we're 40 minutes into this. I really appreciate your time tonight. If, uh, if I need to get another date with you, we should book that now because, uh, 
you're a hard man to get on the show. So sure. I appreciate it. And yeah, we'll no, I'd, lo I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to talk to you again. I'm not so sure about a date, but I'd love to talk <laughs> to you again. Yeah, uh, that's great. We will. We'll definitely. Thanks get for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. We'll we'll get that booked, and uh, I'm sure the audience will look forward to part two of uh, of this conversation. Great. All right. Thanks, my friend. Take care. Thank you. You've been listening to Delivering E-Commerce. It's our passion to have on leaders and suppliers in e-commerce from around the globe, setting you and your strategy up for the next level. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. Connect with Chris on LinkedIn at Chris Parsons on LinkedIn and Spotify at Delivering E-Commerce or on YouTube at Chris Parsons Delivering E-Commerce. Till next time, this is Delivering E-Commerce.